my phone camera has 12 megapixels. This ZV-E1 also has 12 megapixels. Does that mean that these two things are of the same quality? You know, this little pocket camera here from 2011 has 16 megapixels. Does that mean that it's, it's better than these two? You know, this one has 20 megapixels. This one has 42 megapixels. And, you know, this one over here is Sony's flagship camera, the Alpha One, the very tippity top of the food chain. And it has 50 megapixels. But this A7R Mark V has 61 megapixels. So does this A7CR as well. Does that mean that these two are better than this flagship because they have more megapixels than this one? Well, the answer is kind of complicated. And like many things in the tech world, there is rarely a, a manual that you can refer to to know exactly the performance of all the sensors out there and the model numbers and the designs and all of that never really do a good job at telling you what's better than what and why. So that's what we'll be talking about in this video. How many megapixels do you actually need? Hey, I'm Pat Kay, a travel photographer and Sony Digital Imaging Ambassador based in Tokyo, Japan. And this is a continuation of my Beginner's Guide series, the series where I teach new creative skills and concepts for the new content creator. And if you haven't already watched the video on how to choose the best beginner camera, then I highly suggest that you do that first, as this is kind of a slightly more complex complement to that specific video. Now, we'll be going through a lot today, but if you wanna skip all of this and want to learn all there is to know about the creative skill of photography, then check out my Photography Fundamentals course, which I will leave a link to in the description box below. Alrighty, this video is going to be split into four parts. We are going to talk about quality over quantity, your use case, what's available to us today in this crazy world of AI. And then I'm going to share with you how I personally use each one of my cameras and what is acceptable for me. All right, let's get into it. And first, let's talk about this uh, situation again. So my phone versus this very, very expensive, almost top of the line, full frame camera, the Sony ZV-E1. Now, both of these cameras share the same amount of megapixels, 12. Although technically the, the iPhone has 48 megapixels and then they combine all those megapixels together to give you an output of 12. But the ZV-E1 here is 12 natively. So if both of these devices are the same megapixels, how do we know which one is better? Well, the largest determiner is actually the physical size of the sensor itself. Now, you see this? This here is what a full frame sensor looks like. Now, I've already talked about sensor sizes in my best beginner camera video, but just as a refresher, the full frame sensor size is based off the old film days. And it is the size that all other sensors across all cameras are compared against. Think of the full frame sensor size as the baseline. From there, you have sensors that are smaller, like 1.5 times smaller, which are called APS-C sized sensors. And then you have sensors that are like one inch in diameter, which is what you might find here in this RX100. Then you have even smaller sensors, like what is in this phone. So here's a quick little diagram so that you can get a better idea of just how small the phone sensor is compared to a full frame camera. Literally the entire camera module on this phone, which has three lenses and all of that, fits in the same area as the full frame sensor. Now, why is this important? Well, to simplify things, the image that you get to see at the end of the day is made of light. Light from your environment makes its way through the lens and gets focused onto the sensor. And the larger the sensor, the more light is gathered. The more light we start to then gather, the more things we can do with that light without degrading the quality of the image. In super simple terms, this full frame sensor here is massive and gathers a ton of light. And the sensor in this phone here is tiny and doesn't gather even a quarter of the amount that the full frame here does. This means that the phone sensor needs to work very, very hard using increased ISO and most of the time some 
AI trickery and software processing in order to reach the same levels of exposure and image quality as this full frame sensor. More ISO means more noise, less dynamic range, less sharpness and lower image quality overall, all things being equal. So in this instance, physics wins. In an apples to apples comparison, the bigger the sensor, the more image quality you get regardless of how many megapixels it has. Now, another thing when it comes to sensors and megapixels is that megapixels is simply resolution, as in how large the end photo ends up being when it comes out of the camera. A sensor's resolution and its ability to gather light usually operate in the inverse. And this is gonna get a little bit technical here, not that it hasn't been technical already, but a sensor is made up of what is called photocytes. Photocytes are these super tiny little devices that are sensitive to light. And they are what's in the sensor. And that is what does the job of converting photons of light into a digital signal for you to have your image. Now the takeaway from this is that megapixels themselves aren't actually that important. What's more important is the sensor that you're shooting on. What is the size of the sensor? Is the sensor supposed to be for high resolution or high light gathering? And then there are more advanced topics like how a particular sensor handles things like color rendition and sharpness and whether it has a low pass filter over the top of it or whether it's attached to a fast processor and how that affects the autofocus speed and the continuous shooting and on and on and on. It can get super technical, but for you as a beginner, Sensor size, then sensor purpose, and then megapixels after that are really the only things that you need to focus on perhaps in that order. Now, I needed to explain all of that because once you realize that sensors are more about the quality rather than the overall pixels, we can start to level out the playing field and now talk about how many megapixels you actually need. And the answer to that is based on your use case. So let's go through a few of them now. So I would say that across most use cases, most people will be fine with an average of around 24 megapixels or so. Maybe sometimes a little less, maybe sometimes a little more, but something around that. However, if you find yourself with a requirement to say, physically print your images, like on a gigantic wall or in a magazine or something like that, usually bigger is better. The 24 megapixel sensor will allow you to print 20 by 13.3 inches or 50.8 centimeters by 33.9 centimeters at 300 DPI. But if you need something larger than that, then something like a 42 megapixel sensor will allow you to go 26.5 by 17.6 inches or 63.4 by 47.5 centimeters. Or if you're anything like me and you have a requirement to occasionally fill entire walls with your prints, then 61 megapixels will allow you to print at 31.9 9 by 21.3 inches or 81 by 54 centimeters. Now, all of these numbers are assuming 300 DPI, which is what is going to get you very nice and sharp images, regardless of your viewing distance. But you can always stretch that out to 150 or maybe even 200 DPI if you need something extra, extra big. All right, if you're enjoying this video so far, I would really appreciate it if you would hit that like button for me so that I know it's good enough to make even more free videos just like this in the future. All right, another use case here, digital. And when I say digital, I'm talking about the needs that digital might have. So say you are doing a campaign and you need to deliver hero shots for the front page of a website or some creative for an ad or a supporting image for an information block or newsletter or anything online. Usually, most of these assets are going to be far underneath a 4K resolution, especially if it's going on a website, right? Most people aren't going to want to take the performance hit of a huge file size and then thus slowing down their websites. And the reality is, is that 4K resolution is just 8.3 megapixels. Most of the time, your banners are gonna be like, what, 2K at most? And that is just 3.7 megapixels. You know, 1080p or full HD, that's just 2.1 megapixels. How about Instagram? Well, a normal four by five ratio image is 1080 by 1350 pixels, which is just 1.46 megapixels. 
1.46 megapixels. That means if you're shooting on a standard 24 megapixel camera or around there, you're not using 22.5 of your 24 megapixels on your camera. So if you're using cameras for just online stuff, just social stuff, then you don't usually need very many megapixels. For most people, even 12 megapixels or, you know, your phone camera in terms of the size is totally fine. You know, this I have used many, many times on many, many occasions for photos, even though it's a video camera first, but 12 megapixels is totally fine. However, if you are anything like me, then you fall into this next use case, which is pixel peeping and cropping. And keep in mind that if you are a pixel peeper, or you find yourself cropping images to the extreme. For everyone else, know that this is a luxury. And if you don't have the budget for a camera with 42 megapixels or 61 megapixels or whatever, don't worry about it. Because honestly, I, I shoot on my RX100, which is 20 megapixels. I shoot on it all the time and it's totally, totally fine. However, the larger megapixels and the ability to crop in for me is worth the extra money because of the workflow advantages that it provides. While I can do everything that I can to make sure that an image is absolutely perfect as it is straight out of camera, so often do I find myself chopping off the sides of images or rotating things in a certain way or transforming the perspective of an image. And all of this costs resolution, especially in the corners. For me, having the flexibility to do this is a absolutely amazing thing. And it means that I end up with more keepers for any given shoot. It's kind of like a safety net, a fallback. You know, I personally use the APS-C modes on the R series of cameras all the time to punch in from 61 megapixels down into 24 megapixels because it's kind of like having two focal lengths in one singular body. And it's really nice to be able to visualize your crop or create a completely brand new composition all in a single camera body. Again, this is just nice to have. And if you don't have the budget, then that is totally fine as well. Nowadays, you can get AI to upscale any one of your images pretty well. In the past, AI was kind of eh, on taking your images and blowing them up to be as big as you want them to be. But nowadays it's actually pretty good. Photoshop, Stable Diffusion, Topaz Labs, there's actually a ton of AI upscaler services now and they're all pretty good. This is great if you have a lower megapixel count camera, but say you want to take your beloved image and blow it up to something super sharp so that you can print it out or something like that. You can just chuck it into an AI upscaler and off you go. It's obviously kind of a, a pain in the ass from a workflow perspective if you have hundreds or thousands of images to upscale. And for that, then shooting at a higher resolution in the first place is probably a better idea. But aside from that, it is nice to know that you can take your lower megapixel count cameras and AI upscale them today in this AI era. All right, I've already kind of alluded to what I use in the video already, but you know, as a Sony Digital Imaging Ambassador, I do have the luxury of using all of the latest top spec gear. And usually that means high megapixel counts as well. But the honest truth is that I've shot both images and video with all of these cameras and loved the results. You know, for every day, I love the RX100 at 20 megapixels. And some of my most favorite images have come out of this tiny camera with its one inch sensor. When I want something a little bit more walkabout, I take the A7CR, which is 61 megapixels. Although if I had the A7C2 at 33 megapixels, I would totally be fine with that as well. And then when I'm a little bit more serious and I'm on a campaign or shooting for something important, I'm probably dual wielding the Sony Alpha 1 at 50 megapixels and the A7R Mark V at 61 megapixels. So the takeaway is that so long as the quality of the sensor and the setup that you have is good, and as a little side note here, most of the time actually lenses will give you the most performance in terms of sharpness, although that's a whole other video on its own, the megapixels of a camera 
doesn't necessarily matter. What matters more is your use case and whether your sensor and the setup that you have matches the quality of that use case. All right, now back to you. What sensors are you guys using and what do you find adequate for most scenarios and situations? Let me know in the comments below and we can all have a little chat about it. As for this video, that's it. I'll see you in the next one. But until then, get out there and make something that matters. Peace.